This is so fun. Thank you for humoring us there. <laughs> and welcome to the IRDL Scholar Speaker Series. Um, the series is coordinated by a working group of librarian researchers who participated in a professional continuing education program called the Institute for Research Design in Librarianship. We welcome you today from the William H. Hannon Library at Loyola Marymount University, the home of IRDL. My name is Marie Kennedy. I'm the Serials and Electronic Resources Librarian and the co-director of IRDL. Welcoming you also is Christine Brancolini, co-director of IRDL and dean of the library. So this series is designed to shine a spotlight on voices and ideas that challenge traditional ways of conducting research. It examines specific research methods and critiques of processes associated with Western social science approaches with the intention of inspiring research explicitly rooted in social justice. As librarians, educators, and researchers, we welcome this opportunity to pause, reflect, and incorporate what we learn from today's speaker into our own research efforts so that our methodologies integrate anti-racist and anti-colonial practices. We look forward to thinking critically about research and power with you at today's session with Jennifer Esposito. Two IRDL scholars will, will be your moderators for today, Hilary Bissell and Rosalinda Linares. Take it away, Hilary and Rosalinda. Hi everyone, um, my name is Hilary Bissell and I'm a social sciences librarian at Ohio State University. I'm gonna start by acknowledging that the land um, Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. Specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian, Indian Removal Act of 1830. We want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that have and continue to affect the indigenous people of this land. I'm called Rosalinda Linares and I am the Collections and Research Services Librarian at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. I'd like to acknowledge the land that Fort Lewis College is situated upon is the ancestral land and territory of the Nuchu people who are forcibly removed by the United States government. I also acknowledge that this land is connected to the communal and ceremonial spaces of the Hikaril Apache, Pueblos of New Mexico, Hopi Sinam, and Diné nations. It is important to acknowledge the setting because the narratives of the lands in this region have long been told from dominant perspectives which are full, without full recognition of the original land stewards who continue to inhabit and connect with this land. We also recognize the limitations of land acknowledgement statements and that there are specific things that we can do as librarians towards decolonization. If we are committed to anti-racist practices and research approaches, we can take care to acknowledge settler colonialism, white supremacy, and displacement. We really encourage you to engage more personally by researching the different lands we currently inhabit and would like to highlight a few indigenous-led organizations so that you can educate yourselves through native and indigenous as opposed to dominant colonizer perspectives and help you find organizations that you may want to build relationships with based on where you live. Please make use of the URLs which we are posting in the chat for you to explore. We also encourage you to consider these two questions. What does a land acknowledgement mean to me personally? And how am I dismantling settler colonial structures beyond this land acknowledgement? Thank you for your attention. Hillary will now tell you about the session and introduce you to our speaker for the day. We're recording the session and it will be made publicly available on LMU Library's YouTube channel soon. We will be using the live transcription provided by Zoom. The Q&A as well as chat has been enabled. Please use the Q&A to direct questions to the speaker and use the chat for commenting and sharing your thoughts with the group. In the spirit of this series addressing issues of power and research, we're using a progressive stacking approach to the Q&A, and we'll prioritize questions from BIPOC and other marginalized attendees. Please put an asterisk at the front of your question to self-identify. 
We want this to be an uplifting and positive discussion. It's a professional event and we will not tolerate any disrespectful comments in the session. We reserve the right to remove anyone from today's session if we observe anything that does not honor our speaker or fellow attendees. So our plan for this event is to invite our speaker, Dr. Jennifer Esposito, to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, after that, we'll have about 30 minutes to talk about practical applications within LIS. We will save time for questions and answers at the end. Dr. Jennifer Esposito is a full professor and department chair of educational policy studies at Georgia State University. Her research takes an intersectional approach to qualitative research centering on race and gender. As an interdisciplinary scholar, she sees critical theories as tools to interrogate social life and solve problems related to the material con consequences of oppression and privilege. Her most recent co-authored book, Introduction to Intersectional Qualitative Research, teaches novice researchers how to design and carry out studies from an intersectional perspective. Another co-authored book, Intersectional Analysis of Popular Culture Texts, Clarity in the Matrix, applies an intersectional lens to analyze different popular culture forms. Dr. Esposito was trained as a qualitative methodologist over 20 years ago by the late Sari Bicklin at Syracuse University. When she's not nerding out about methodology, she plays poker, reads fiction and poetry, and spends time with her daughters and spouse. Jennifer Esposito's talk today is titled Intersectional Qualitative Research, Centering Race and Gender to Conduct Humane and Ethical Research. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thank you to Hillary and Rosalinda for this exciting opportunity to talk to you today. And a special thanks to Marie and Carol for coordinating my session. I hope my research approach resonates with many of you and it's very exciting to see people from of various parts of the world. I look forward to the Q&A and the discussion at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. My talk is called Intersectional Qualitative Research, Centering Race and Gender to Conduct Humane and Ethical Research. I grew up on the border of two cultures, Cuban and Italian. And I think making sense of who I am in relationship to race and culture has been an ongoing journey. I'm also the mother of two daughters who are now teenagers. This was a photo of them when they were much smaller. My identity as a mother has always shaped my identities as both a teacher and a scholar. As a teacher, I was interested in understanding the cultural knowledge students brought to me um, and brought to the classroom. As a scholar, my identity as a Latina mother of two girls of color shaped my research focus. Invariably, I was interested in making education a better place for all kids, but particularly girls of color. As a popular culture enthusiast, I watched Disney movies with my daughters and taught them how to analyze the representations for um, in particular stereotypes around race and gender. They didn't like it initially and would routinely disparage my efforts with multiple eye rolls and you think the Lion King is racist. Now as teenagers, they have a greater understanding of these stereotypical representations, not just Disney of course, but in all popular culture texts. They also understand how they become seen in the world based on these stereotypes and representations. The book um, that this talk is loosely based on is how to do intersectional qualitative research. So to do good qualitative research, I believe you must pay close attention to 
intersectionality, um, which I will define momentarily. Concerns about race, gender, class, sexuality, power, and privilege should shape every aspect of a research project. Can you do qualitative research without paying attention to these identities? Yes, you can, and many researchers do, but my co-author and I don't recommend it. In the spirit of ethical research, we don't think you can ignore the major identities that shape a participant's life. Um, and I'm including my co-author on this slide, Dr. Venus Evans Winters. She and I have been writing together for 20 years. We met as doctoral students. Um, she attended the University of Illinois and I attended Syracuse. As graduate students, we noticed what we um, ended up thinking of as a piecemeal approach to academic research. So for example, we would read critical race theory in courses that focused on the sociology of education. We read feminist theory in women's studies courses, and we would learn about qualitative research in research methods courses. Um, and there was something enchanting for me about qualitative research as well as for my co-author, but it was disconnected so much from our experiences as Black and Latina girls coming from urban school contexts. 20 years ago, when she and I were both still in graduate school, CRT scholar Dr. Garrett Duncan introduced us to each other and asked that we present on an American Educational Research Association presidential panel that was called The Next Generation of Scholars of Color. We presented separate pieces. However, in the socialization that occurred while at the conference, Venus and I connected as colleagues, then friends, and finally as sisters. So during these 20 years, we've supported each other through raising children, negotiating tenure and promotion, and cultivating space for ourselves in an academy that could be hostile to our ideas and ourselves. We've been writing together since that initial AERA panel mostly incorporating critical race theory, critical race feminism, and intersectionality. And as qualitative methodologists and intersectional feminists, we think it's important to center race and gender in all aspects of research. And as scholars who are preparing the next generation of scholars, we know that it is just as important for researchers to think how race, gender, and other overlapping identities influence, influences one's research questions, data collection, interpretations, and analysis. Um, as, as emerging scholars, we both felt passionate and committed to how race and gender would and should inform research as a body of theory and methodologies. For us, we couldn't do research without also doing gender or doing race. And so we refused to disconnect research from our identities as mothers, teachers, and social justice workers. Our collective wisdom required us to examine how power, privilege, and oppression played out differently in marginalized people's lives. We had been taught that quantitative research was limiting because it doesn't provide contextual information in explaining norms and trends. If race and gender are variables that could be controlled for, then certainly the results were missing large parts of the story. On the other hand, we were presented as if qualitative research was our savior. Yet qualitative research is also limiting because it continues to represent the researcher as this omnipresent knower of other people's lives. We realized that our view of methodology was completely shaped by constraints imposed by colonization and that decolonizing methodologies were not easy to conduct because often they raise so many complex issues that most institutions weren't willing to engage with them. In the um, IQR book, I share a story about what I was taught about Rosa Parks. I grew up believing 
that Rosa Parks was a tired old seamstress on her way home from work. She was so tired, in fact, that she had to sit down on a bus seat that was reserved for white people during Jim Crow segregation. I was astounded to learn in college that this was not at all what happened. Instead, Ms. Parks was a well-trained civil rights activist and her actions had been planned and rehearsed. Her well-connected network of activists were part of this resistance. My knowledge of civil rights and activism had been limited and constrained, despite the fact that I attended grade school in New York City public schools in the late 70s. My understanding of Rosa Parks had been informed by white supremacist patriarchy that could not and did not credit Parks for being the activist she was. And in the book, I use this example as a way to show how power relations inform our epistemologies or how we know what we know. It's also an example of how stories become knowledge. The stories that get told again and again, and this story was the dominant way that Parks was taught in schools in the 70s and 80s, become knowledge that becomes increasingly more difficult to challenge the more people believe it to be true. In intersectional qualitative research, your ontological and epistemological framework is intricately connected to how you conduct research, from what questions you ask to how you go about answering those questions. For those that may not be familiar with the difference between quantitative and qualitative research, quantitative research deals with numbers, while qualitative research deals with narratives. Quant research emerges out of a history of positivism, and this is just an ideological framework that sees knowledge as quantifiable and able to be understood and verified through scientific testing. Back when you learned about the scientific method in elementary school, you were probably introduced to hypotheses and variables. This is the basis for quant research, and it is often assumed to be the gold standard of science. Qualitative research comes out of a different, um, a different epistemological tradition. So, it's um, called constructivism. And this theory, constructivism, believes that we actively construct knowledge. So we come to understand the social world through our experiences. Quant research has hid behind this cloak of supposed objectivity, which means that the researcher has no presumed effect on the research. While qualitative research has been criticized for being too subjective, which means the researcher basically discovers what they want to find in the research. Both have their strengths and weaknesses, but the reality is that very few quantitative researchers are willing to reveal quantitative research's weaknesses. I share this with you because in this presentation, I will reveal some of traditional qualitative research's weaknesses. However, I believe that both tradi traditions have their own problems as well as their own strengths. And the difference is often that qualitative researchers are, revealing, are willing to reveal and walk through some of our weaknesses while quantitative researchers, for the most part, continue to hide behind their cloak of being the gold standard of scientific research. So I've been using this term intersectionality, um, and I know that I haven't defined it for you. So it's commonly referred to as an analytic an analytical tool. It's used to make sense of the complexity of lived experience. And Intersectionality has what is referred to sometimes as a multiple origin story. It can't necessarily be traced in a linear format. Maria Stewart was a Black woman and writer and public speaker, um, and she was one of the first to articulate the centrality of race, class, and gender as early as 1831. 
From there, Sojourner Truth, Ida B. Wells, Anna Julia Cooper, among others, advanced the theory. And feminists of color have been building on this work. Um, some of the terms that you might already be familiar with include multiplicative effects, interlocking oppression, double jeopardy, simultaneous oppression. And finally, Patricia Hill Collins came up with what was called the matrix, the matrix of domination to show how multiple and simultaneous oppression could exert material consequences. Intersectionality is a culturally situated theory, and it recognizes that our identities have material consequences in an oppressive world. I'd like to share this very quick video with you by the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today we hear the call for full equality for women and distinctly for women of color from a multiplicity of perspectives. Intersectionality is a term we often hear, but what does it mean? Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term in 1989, explains it with a metaphor. Consider an intersection made up of many roads. The roads are the structures of race, gender, gender identity, class, sexuality, disability. And the traffic running through those roads are the practices and policies that discriminate against people. Now, if an accident happens, it can be caused by cars traveling from any number of directions and sometimes from all of them. So if a Black woman is harmed because she is in an intersection, her injury could result from discrimination from any or all directions. Intersectionality in all discussions of the rights of African American women today is built on the work of previous generations who have always been a part of the fight for full equality. Sojourna Truth escaped slavery in 1827 and became one of the most powerful women's rights activists of her time. She emphasized her identity as both African American and woman in her famous Ain't I a Woman speech at the Women's Convention in 1851. In 1893, Anna Julia Cooper addressed the World Congress of Representative Women saying, the white woman could at least plead for her own emancipation. The black woman, doubly enslaved, could but suffer and struggle and be silent. They demanded recognition of both the femaleness and blackness of African-American women in the struggle for political and social advancement. In 1951, the Sojourners for Truth put a call out to Negro women to convene in Washington, D.C. for a Sojourn for Truth and Justice. 132 women from 14 states responded. During the Sojourner's last Eastern Seaboard Conference, they discussed the organizational tenets of fighting against triple oppression facing working class Black women of racism, sexism, and classism. Their efforts were a precursor to the Black freedom activism of the Black Power era and the Black feminist movement. Named for a raid led by Harriet Tubman, which freed more than 750 slaves, the Kumbahi River Collective was founded in 1974 by a group of self-identified queer Black feminists. Their Kumbahi River Collective statement was one of the earliest explorations of the intersection of multiple oppressions to include sexuality. They stated, our politics initially sprang from shared belief that Black women are inherently valuable. The words and actions of these leaders continue to contribute to today's discussion around intersectionality, feminism, and civil rights that demand equality and inclusion for all. So what is intersectional qualitative research? I think up until now, we've, um, I've been talking about in the video talked about intersectionality as a theory. So as a theoretical framework, inter intersectionality makes clear that the interconnections of identities matter since all of us are situated within structures of power. We can't walk through the world without confronting race, class, and gender. These overlapping identities exert material consequences on our lives. So when oppression occurs, we will never be able to separate whether it was due to a, to a particular identity. And the same is true when privilege occurs. As a research methodology, IQR claims that research needs to represent intersectional concerns from why you even want to conduct the study 
to the research questions you ask, how you sample and recruit participants, how you collect data, how you make sense of data, and to finally how you represent everything. Intersectional qualitative research relies on what Gloria Anzaldúa called theory in the flesh. So we are embodied researchers who are conducting research in a particular historical, political, and social moment. Scholars of color in particular are often seen as engaging in less objective or theoretical research than white scholars. But over the years, there's been a pushback and a path built for us to claim that theorizing space that Enzel Dua refers to on this slide, um, a space to claim our theories and our approaches are just as valid. So intersectionality as an analytical and methodological tool presupposes that the multiple perspectives of the marginalized and oppressed offer unique and at times divergent viewpoints of the social world and ultimately the research experience. Um, using intersectionality as a research me methodology means moving beyond a singular critique and analysis of power and domination. Intersectional methodologies juxtapose social categories to systems of power and social phenomena to power relations. And the researcher must be prepared to accept complexity as part of the research process. So we call IQR an intentional interruption. So it's, it's an attempt to center the cultural experience, values and beliefs of research participants. We need to address the values of the researched, but also the researcher must be willing to submit to what I call a methodological gaze. So ask yourself, how are my decisions as the researcher continually informing and shaping the study? There also needs to be a recognition that some people's claims and beliefs are taken more seriously. And we've seen this throughout history. Claims and beliefs coming out of majority communities are often seen as objective, while claims from Black, Indigenous, people of color, or BIPOC communities are automatically viewed with suspicion and seen as subjective or emotional. IQR intends to challenge authoritarian and majoritarian conceptualizations of validity. If we challenge whose knowledge is deemed more credible, then we can also get, um, we can also challenge what gets counted as knowledge, as well as claims to how valid research findings are. IQR relies on cultural knowledge and intuition. So if we embrace the use of cultural intuition and collective historical knowledge as methodological tools, um, we can try to attempt to disrupt knowledge apartheid or the fact that some knowledges are still held and deemed as more, value, um, more valid. And then finally, IQR acknowledges, <clears throat> excuse me, and affirms the knowledge production of BIPOC um, communities. We continually embrace and demonstrate that there are multiple ways of being in the world and therefore multiple ways of knowing, understanding, navigating, and interpreting the social world. So ethical um, intersectional research, we have to make sure that we don't uphold domination, whether this is intentionally or unintentionally. And the reality we have to face is that we might still uphold domination because we didn't know better at the time, we missed something, or we didn't think critically enough. And I share with students in research methods classes all the time that once you, um, conduct research, whether it be for your master's thesis, your dissertation, or an article or book you're writing, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 
it will be revealed that you've missed something, that you weren't critical in the way that um, people are critical at that moment in time, 20 or 30 years later. This is part of doing, intersec um, of doing intersectional research. We can try to be as ethical and humane as we can, but the reality is we might miss something. So in my title, I use the terms um, ethical and humane. Um, if you've read the article that was shared with you before this talk, using others in the nicest way possible, in that article, my co-author and I argue that qualitative research actually involves using participants. And academics like to believe that all research is useful and or good research that, that, and that the benefits to society outweigh the harm. But what if that's not true? And that's one of the things that we grapple with in the article. We eventually argue that by necessity, conducting qualitative research or any research for that matter means that we have to use people as researchers committing, committed to eradicating social inequities, this means that we try to use people in the nicest way possible. So IQR recommends continually evaluating oneself in relationship to the research. And in that article, we call this an ethic of humility. Um, we don't intend um, that the focus on the researcher be a narcissistic endeavor, but rather a recognition that as the storytellers of someone else's lives, it's imperative that we be upfront about our thoughts and interrogate ourselves deeper than we do our participants. Um, so there's three points here that are part of ethic of humility. We don't know it all as researchers. In fact, we don't know much. So as researchers, we should always believe that there's more to learn. Why else would we engage in research? Although we may spend our lifetimes thinking and reading and writing about a particular subject, um, that doesn't mean that, we're, that we've been truly comprehensive or that we're the authority on that subject. Two, we will get some of it right, but most of it wrong. So our mistakes may not be as apparent as a quantitative researcher. So in a lab, for instance, um, a quantitative researcher could, an error could cause an animal death. If you're working with chemicals, it could cause an explosion. Mistakes in qualitative research may have emotional and material effects on our participants. And in that article, we use the example of a participant dealing with the trauma of memories that research helped unearth. Um, another example that we use is that um, often university partnerships with local schools and local communities help the universities more than they do the schools and communities. So for those of us who understand our work as resisting oppression, probable error compels us to ask these communities what would be most helpful. And the third part of this ethic of humility is that we probably need our subjects and participants more that, than they need us. If our research was so helpful um, and so necessary to participants, we would probably be invited on a daily basis into particular communities to engage in research. And instead, this rarely happens. Just as we were making progress as critical researchers in claiming theoretical space and telling our own stories, um, we began to see growing attacks against race-based theory and research. So you can't go far in the news these days without hearing about the attack on critical race theory in schools and universities. My own state of Georgia passed legislation banning discussions of systemic oppression and racism 
in K-12 classrooms. And what many people don't know is that this is a coordinated and well-funded attack by conservative think tanks. The National Education Policy Center recently put out a report on understanding the attacks against critical race theory or CRT. They review the historical attacks, but focus most recently on the attack against the 1619 Project. And for those who don't know, the 1619 Project was originally written by Nicole Hannah-Jones. It was a journalistic report that reframed the impact of slavery on American history. Curriculum materials were eventually developed and introduced into over 3,500 classrooms, and the materials were officially adopted by, at that time, five large school systems. And while the 1619 Project doesn't use CRT necessarily, the attacks against both are often bundled together as there is continual resistance to the honest examination of racism and slavery in this country. You can trace many of the local bans against CRT um, stemming from former President Trump's executive order 13950, which was issued in September 2020. And this executive order withheld federal monies from institutions that quote, promoted divisive concepts. Following that federal mandate, mandate, Republican legislatures in 26 states introduced copycat legislation banning the use of divisive concepts in school curriculum. This didn't happen by accident. And again, it was a coordinated attack fueled and funded by the American Legislative Exchange Council, better known as ALEC, the Goldwater Institute, Koch Family Foundations, Manhattan Institute, as well as billionaire funded advocacy organizations such as Parents Defending Education. Um, this policy report notes that Manhattan Institute Senior Fellow Christopher Rufo actually produced a CRT briefing book intended to teach parents how to mobilize against CRT and push for the curriculum and libraries to be devoid of honest discussions about race. Um, why do I bring this to your attention in a talk about intersectional qualitative research? It's because as a scholar, I'm using and teaching about a race-based methodology. You can't conduct IQR if you don't think that race matters and that racism exists. Conducting IQR means that you have to center race and other identities and be mindful of the effects of these identities on people's lives. The second reason I bring this to your attention is because the attacks have made their ways to school libraries with these same groups calling for the ban of books that discuss race, racism, gender, sexism, homophobia, uh, transphobia, et cetera. Your own school districts might already be engaged in book bans. And while the university has more academic freedom than the K-12 space, the attacks are coming there as well. So this is a picture posted by a South Lake, Texas teacher in protest of book bans in that district. Some of you may know about South Lake because it made national news for its fight recently over the school board's diversity plan. And this picture was in protest of the 850 school library books that state representative Matt Krause of Texas questioned. The books on the list included a book about gay teenagers, as well as a book about quinceañeras, the Latina coming of age ritual. I also did just a um, kind of a Google search out of personal interest on what news reports were saying regarding these book bans. And you can see many of these um, were published in September, October, November of 2021. 
a war on books, conservatives push for audits of school libraries. This is politically motivated, controversy over Fairfax County school library books. Um, and then one of the ones that I thought was the most interesting in Central York, kids rose up to save books on MLK and Rosa Parks from their parents. Um, so this is happening, of course, around the country. And it is um, coordinated with the attack on CRT. So while I look forward to hearing your ideas about ways to apply IQR to library science, I did want to come up with a few ideas to share with you um, regarding how I might apply it. And library science is not my content area. Uh, my content area is more so the social foundations of education. However, um, an obvious project that I could come up with is engaging in a comprehensive review of your library's offerings in terms of diversity. So put, you know, maybe a race lens or a gender lens um, on the project. So, you know, what are the races of the authors in your holdings? What about the genders? How many books deal with social issues? And it would be up to you to define what that means. Because I've talked so much about reflection upon the part of the researcher, I think you can also, excuse me, engage in some personal reflection. So which books are featured the most prominently in the physical space of your library and why? Or which books do you recommend to students or kids based on race, gender, and why? Given my love of popular culture also, I thought about a potential study related to librarians in popular culture. So film, television, and even children's books are often full of representations of librarians. They may not always be main characters, uh, but nonetheless, they exist to help children, especially develop ideas about who librarians are and what their roles are. And you can see in this slide, um, there's reference to the movie Party Girl. Um, party Girl is about a 20 something irresponsible party girl. She's bailed um, out of jail by her librarian godmother to repay the loan. She starts working at the library and gradually turns her life around and eventually her looks as well. Um, there's also a librarian from the television show Parks and Rec, and then a librarian from one of the, um, the original Ghostbusters. I know there's a new one out. Uh, there's also, you can also engage in a research project on debunking the stereotype of the librarian. Librarians are often portrayed in popular culture as um, a stern white woman who wears glasses and a bun. She scolds people for talking too loudly or um, if they're having fun in the library. Her personal life is assumed to be as someone who lives alone with a house full of cats. And this stereotype hurts the profession because we know librarians are diverse in appearance, they're diverse in race and culture, and they're diverse in the ways they enforce rules in the library. So in the end, this stereotype hurts librarians. So it's important to understand how it's communicated in popular culture. I remember when my youngest daughter found out in sixth grade that her school librarian was actually really cool. Um, in fact, she turned my daughter onto Jacqueline Woodson books. And to this day, I won't remind her that I bought her a Woodson book for Christmas in fourth grade, but then she lost it. Instead, I want her to continue believing that her librarian is full of ideas about good books and she's fun to talk to and doesn't spend her time telling students to be quiet. When I was first invited to do this session, I immediately reached out to one of my favorite university librarians 
at my own university, um, Mandy Swigert Hoba. She provided some wonderful insight into library science and also helped me find research that used a race-based approach in library science. So I've included a few of these articles on the slide. So you can see that critical race theory and intersectionality are already being used in library science. Finally, um, as researchers, we can never forget that our research modalities, whether they are quantitative or qualitative, are embedded in practices that have historically centered settler colonial ideologies. I know and understand that I have made my career from educational research, but I still remain unsettled by this. I am a perpetrator in this game of naming um, who, who gets to be researched, who gets to do the researching, and most importantly, who ultimately benefits from the research that we do. We are simultaneous, and this is a quote from my um, mine and Venus's book, we are simultaneously the other in a space that has tried to white us out, shut us up, and pretend we are not smart enough to speak in their language. Yet here we are as full professors who made it and are writing a textbook for the next generation to follow. Um, following that quote in the book, we have a variety of questions that we ask ourselves and that do remain unanswered. So I hope that those who are interested in intersectional qualitative research will help create a world where others are asking themselves similar questions. And finally, where we can reach a place where answering those questions doesn't mean injuring our souls or the souls of our people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that great talk. Um, we are now going to open it up to questions. Um, and actually, uh, I'd like to kick us off uh, with a question, um, if that's OK. Um, in your article, Using Others in the Nicest Way Possible, you and your co-author take turns reflecting on your positions in your research project. Um, and the impact that the research may have on your subjects as well as yourself. Taking time to reflect on this seems like a really useful exercise for someone who's new to research um, to gain a better understanding on their own um, positionality in the research project process. So is this something you'd recommend? Um, and if so, is there any kind of format or template that you would guide a new, research, uh, new researcher to for kind of doing this reflective practice? Thank you, Hillary. Um, yeah, in when I teach research methods, one of the things I suggest to students who are planning on conducting any type of interview study is to have a trusted friend or colleague use the exact same interview questions on the intended researcher. And so you get the understanding of what it's like. Are these questions appropriate? You know, um, are they too personal? Are they damaging in any type of way? Um, so I, I do always encourage that as a practice. And then regarding reflection, um, I teach really more so to write analytical memos um, because I'm teaching graduate students and I want them to keep track of their thoughts about the research so that way when they ultimately write up their research for the dissertation, they'll have almost a linear thinking of um, you know, thoughts regarding the, different, the project that they're working on. Uh, but people can use a diary, a journal, you know, whatever form researchers are already comfortable with. Many of us who do qualitative research are attracted to it because we're already storytellers of some sort or writers of some sort. And so many researchers already engage in some kind of journaling. And so I would say, you know, keep 
whatever you're comfortable with, as long as you're doing it, that's the hardest part is to, you know, get in the habit of really writing down your thoughts instead of thinking about them as you shower or as you drive. Um, another thing that um, has become easier of late with all the technology available to us is doing a uh, an audio journal. So instead of spending time typing at your computer or using an old school notebook, um, I do encourage researchers to, you know, keep an audio journal on their phone. There's some, you know, different apps that you can use to do that. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up with a question from the Q&A, and I think this question really speaks to, you know, who are we talking about when we're talking about marginalized groups and sort of the history of whiteness in the U.S., so I thought this would be a good one for, for, for us to kind of start off with when we're talking about these specific groups. So this uh, question is from, and I apologize if I mispronounce names, um, I think it's Madeline Ruggiero. Uh, why are Italians not included in this marginalized group? Italian immigrants in the mid-century and before were not treated as inherently valuable. The roads were not paved in gold when they arrived here. They were expected to pave the roads. My Italian immigrant parents also, and this is a quote, understood the dehumanization of forced removal, relocation, re-education, redefinition, the hum humiliation of having to falsify their own reality and voice. And that's a quote from one of your articles. Thank you. I think it's a great question and, you know, it's one that scholars grapple with. Um, as Rosalinda said, what is the meaning of whiteness? And I think I would direct um, you to the book, How the Irish Became White. And I'm, I'm blanking on the author's name, but it's a, it's a really interesting sociological look of who gets deemed with the privilege of being white. And, you know, as I shared at the beginning of my talk, you know, I am half Italian and I am second generation. Um, so I, you know, I understand that multiple immigrant groups um, have grappled with this, they've grappled with belonging. And I think for me, you know, part of it is it's easier for some ethnic groups to assimilate purely based on skin color. I can walk through the world and while I don't intend to pass solely as white or as Italian, I think that I can, you know, many people I can be in mixed settings and, you know, rarely someone will, you know, say, well, what are you in the same way that they ask my darker skinned daughters, what are you? Because all of a sudden they're seen as not white. Um, so I think while Italians, Irish, um, you know, they had their own struggles in coming to this country and, you know, participating in the Industrial Revolution. I think that there was an easier assimilation solely based on skin color. Our next question is, um, do you have experience with participatory action research? If so, what advice would you give to someone doing participatory action research with marginalized groups? Um, great question. I've, I've actually, um, the last time I conducted partic participatory action research was many years ago with a group of middle school girls and it was around um, stereotypes within popular culture. But it is a research tradition that many of my students um, really become invested in and want to do. Um, and so the question is, do I have suggestions for researchers who are using that approach? Uh, um, With yeah, I, sorry, Hillary, can you say that again? Um, who are using the approach with marginalized groups. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you always want to be careful that you aren't setting yourself up as the omnipresent knower. So as the researcher, you're there to learn from your participants. Obviously, depending on age of your participants, sometimes you will have to lead the project, um, provide more ideas, uh, but sometimes you won't have to, you know, people have ideas of what they 
want investigated in their own communities, in their own culture. And so I think having open and honest discussions with your participants from the very beginning is the most helpful. Um, and while I, you know, I caution researchers against being the omnipresent knower, I think you also can't shed all of your power and your authority. You still are the researcher. Um, in many cases, you perhaps will have more privilege, you know, be it more formal education, um, perhaps, you know, a, a privileged race or class status, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so you need to be mindful of that. Um, I'm not saying that when you walk in the room and say, hey, I'm here to conduct participatory action research with you and I want you to lead the way, um, that doesn't absolve you of the power and authority that is already bestowed upon you given that you are a researcher. Thank you. And as a follow up to this, which isn't necessarily specifically related to participatory action research, but could be could be applied to perhaps any kind of qualitative methodology. Um, what are your thoughts on engaging members of a research community that you plan to create a project around to collaborate with you in a researcher role and how to do this with an ethic of humility? Yeah, I, I think that is um, the intent behind more participatory forms of research is, you know, getting people together to help you craft what it is that um, needs to be investigated. And again, it goes back to this idea of why are we even there to research in the first place? Is our goal to truly help or to solve a problem? And if so, then yes, it's imperative that you have participants help you figure out what the problem is in their own communities, especially if you're not part of the community. The best you know, type of participatory action research would really come from you being a member of that community. And you know, therefore, you may already be um, someone that people trust and you know, look up to for better or for worse. Um, the next question is from Maxwell Gray. Um, thank you for this presentation. I especially appreciated your discussion of book bans in public libraries. The ALA Library Bill of Rights seemingly represents a radical principle slash version of intellectual freedom. Um, quote is, materials should not be excluded because of the origin, background, or views of those contributing to their creation, unquote. But what about materials that seek to affect the exclusion of disadvantaged and marginalized groups in our communities? Can we practice meaningfully ethical librarianship if we don't exclude materials like this? So for example, white supremacist materials, misogynist materials, homophobic materials. So I think Maxwell, what you're asking is if you do exclude materials that could be harmful to people, are you engaging in meaningful ethical librarianship because you're not making those materials available? Um, I, I personally would say that you are engaging in ethical librarianship because why would you include materials that could knowingly hurt or degrade other people? Um, you know, the, the things that you name, white supremacy, misogyny, homophobia, I mean, these are entrenched ideological traditions that do have material consequences on people's lives. And in particular, if you're a K-12 librarian, you know, you're serving a community of, um, you know, kids who are impressionable, who are struggling with, you know, their own kind of ideas of what it means to be in the world based on who they are. And so I would, I would encourage, um, you know, a, a close look at holdings. And, you know, I do think it's ethical to remove things that um, can be harmful that, you know, are sexist, that are racist, that are homophobic. Thank you. We still have a couple more Q&A questions here. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee um, who didn't get a chance to read your article. So if you kind of want to give a little recap uh, based on the question, 
Uh, what are your thoughts about where and how to discuss the ethic of humility and the impact of the intersecting identities of researchers and research subjects in your published writing? And do you ask research subjects about how they self-identify, if so, how? Um, so in, um, so yeah, that um, I, I hope Interlibrary Loan is able to get you the article, um, but I can just, you know, give kind of a, a brief recap of it. Um, in the article, my co-author and I reflected on two separate research projects where we struggled with some ethics behind them um, and ultimately ended up questioning, you know, why, why we do research to begin with and can it ever be of benefit to the people that are being researched? Is it always only of value to us as academic researchers? Um, and so the, the question is asking, where and how do you discuss the ethic of humility and the ways that um, intersecting identities of researchers and subjects or participants affect the research? And I think that's a great question because part of it depends on the audience that you're writing for. There are some academic journals who um, you know, want you to to say more about that relationship, to say more about who you are as the researcher, as well as who your participants are. And then there are other um, academic journals maybe coming out of a more traditional space that um, don't necessarily wanna see a long and lengthy complicated discussion of how that all plays out. And the reality is we don't know how it all plays out. I mean, we can do our best with our personal reflections with the journals that we've kept over time. We can do our best to try to, um, you know, assume how it all plays out. But even in the article, I shared um, a project that I did, and this was 20 years ago when I was a graduate student. Um, my primary informant or my primary participant, I really struggled with how much time he gave to me in a summer where I was um, studying him and his group of friends and comrades. Um, and I, you know, ultimately wanted to help him in any way that I could, but he didn't want nor desire my help. And so I had to leave knowing that you know, he gave all of this to me and I'm not sure I gave at, back to him at the same level. And then I see there's also a, like a second question um, connected to this question. Do you ask research subjects about how they self-identify? Absolutely, I do. Um, and you know, it really depends. Most of my research in the past has been interview based um, and also ethnographic. So I'm spending time with people, I'm talking to them. And so I would just ask directly, you know, how, how do you self identify? Um, I also have people choose their own pseudonyms because, you know, I think people find that to be a fun exercise. It's like naming your kids or your pets. You get to name how you'd like to be presented in the research. Um, so I do think it's important not to assume how people self-identify and just ask directly. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Christine Brancolini and she asks, do you have any specific hard or critical questions that you recommend to your graduate students? I think the number one question um, Christine, that graduate students should ask themselves is, why am I researching this particular topic? What is the investment that I have in it? Um, what would be the benefit to the community that I'm studying? You know, sometimes our research is used for um, more negative purposes, and we don't mean for it to be used in that way. But I think it's worth, you know, asking yourself, how could my research be twisted around to um, exert a more negative influence on the community that I'm studying? So I think that should be, you know, number one question, why am I doing this? Um, and what are the consequences of this research? Uh, 
All right, I think for the next 25 minutes, we're gonna switch over to, oh, I think we actually just got one more question in that I wanna ask you from Brenda Nicolas. Uh, amazing presentation, thank you. I'm assigning the book this semester for my interdisciplinary and intersectional research methods course in Chicanx Latinx studies. What are some major interests, interests that students usually draw from or on? Question one. What are some materials you recommend for an upper division course? I'm teaching this class for the first time. Um, Brenda, that's amazing uh, to hear that you're already teaching a course on intersectional research methods and also that you're assigning the book. Thank you. Um, major interest that you that students usually draw from. So I teach at Georgia State, which is um, considered a minority serving institution. The majority of students identify as Black or African American. And so we have the majority of the students that I teach to draw from critical race theory and intersectionality. They're really interested in race based approaches. Um, I teach throughout the College of Education. We have seven different departments. So there's a variety of um, topics that students engage in because they, you know, some are K-12 teachers, some are school counselors, um, some are studying to be uh, physical therapists or occupational therapists. So there's a whole range of interests, but I would say, you know, they center their research around a race-based approach. Um, and then regarding awesome materials. So, um, one of my colleagues is teaching with the book. Um, she, this is her second semester using it, and um, she does have a syllabus. Um, I can always ask her if she's willing to share. So, uh, Brenda, you can feel free to email me, and I can see if um, she can share some of the materials because she's put together this fabulous. Um, a fabulous syllabus that has some articles that go with each chapter in the book. Um, we have a question now from um, Melissa Cardenas Dow. Um, have there been negative influences from the academy on emphasizing the ethic of humility? For example, criticisms of lesser rigor in research design. If there are, how do you deal with these sorts of criticisms and any advice on how to deal with such? Thank you, Melissa, for that question. Um, if you were to ask me this question 20 years ago, I would have had a completely different answer. But um, as I reveal in the book, I feel like I've made it, so to speak, in academia. I've become a full professor. I've earned that title. And I'm also now um, the leader of my department. I'm, I'm serving as department chair. Um, and so I have now an unshakable confidence in the research approach um, that I stand behind. 20 years ago, as an untenured faculty member, those criticisms, and yes, they came often, um, you know, within my own institution, as well as, um, you know, when I would send papers out for review for different journals. Um, definitely qualitative research, especially race-based approaches were seen as um, approaches that had lesser rigor, less valid, um, you know, not um, not considered the gold standard that I talked about in the presentation. Um, how did I deal with it initially? You know, they each one was kind of a blow to my self esteem, but eventually I just started hitting delete on emails with like really bad, negative or inappropriate criticism. Um, and, you know, just decided that what I was doing was worthy. Um, and I, you know, I think it, I think it is, I mean, the, um, the book IQR has gotten um, some pretty great positive attention, um, which, you know, I, I think is well deserved. We've worked on it and, you know, struggled with this for 20 years of how best to articulate it in a way that made sense to novice researchers. Intersectionality, you know, it is um, academic speak. You know, it's a language that um, only some of us who are formally educated have access to. And we wanted to try really hard to reach 
kind of a wider audience and write in a way where um, people could understand us from you know, multiple backgrounds and who may not have attained the, the same level of education that we had. Um, so I ignore the criticism now. I think it's the best thing to do. Um, and if, you know, if you're wondering about this for your own journey um, as an academic, I would say that the field has grown so tremendously. I mean, the fact that this talk is even happening, this wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. The lesser known approaches weren't, um, you know, getting any type of attention. So I think the tradition and the field itself has expanded and we've carved out space for ourselves. And so, you know, I welcome you into that space and ignore the haters. Thank you so much. Um, Hillary, what do you think about uh, asking this question for the audience and then starting to talk about applications in LIS? Did you want to ask that question? I can um, put it in the I, chat. I'll put it in oh, the chat. Oh, um, in the chat. I, I can put it in the chat if you want to ask. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, okay, so our question for the audience is for those um, who have embraced the ethic of humility, um, <clears throat> The, the, that you don't know at all, um, and in fact, don't know much um, in your own research. Um, how have you done that, if you've done that? And um, how have you thought about that concept and how, and did it manifest in your research in any way? So this is a question for the audience. Um, you can either unmute or um, put, it, put your answer in the chat. So while we're waiting for that, uh, Hillary, have you have you been thinking about the ethic of humility lately and how it kind of applies to any research that you're doing? Not to put you on the spot. I mean, yes. I'll, although I will say, and I don't know if um, this is getting too off topic with this, but I so I'm teaching a class this semester that just began yesterday, a full uh like a full semester long class and i've been thinking about the ethic of humility and bringing that into the classroom um with students um because what i really want to emphasize to them is um coming to readings and and discussions with sort of a curiosity and not necessarily thinking that you have the right answers but asking questions and i'm trying to model that as a teacher um, and also, you know, thinking too about modeling that in my research. Um, I think my focus right now is a little bit more on teaching. So I'm kind of curious, Jennifer, is this something that you also try to bring into your classroom? It is. Um, I, I, on one of my slides, I almost shared kind of the history of getting the book published, but I, you know, I ultimately decided not to. But originally, our original editor wanted um, an intro to qual book with intersectionality in little text boxes. And so instead of being incorporated throughout, they wanted us to write a very traditional, this is how you conduct qualitative research, and then, you know, little applications. So this is how you can apply intersectionality to your study. And we resisted that idea and were ultimately um, reassigned to someone who said, no, you know, just go ahead and write about this intersectional approach. So write the in an in intro textbook to intersectional qualitative research. And so um, I do think that you can't do research um, without thinking about this ethic of humility. And, you know, I'm not going to lie and say I always thought about it because I didn't, which is how this um, article using others in the nicest way possible came to be. I wasn't necessarily always thinking about how I could serve my participants or what they were gaining. Um, it was in the back of my mind, but, you know, in the end, I let it go and I got my PhD and I was done and I walked away from that community. And so I think um, it is something that I bring into the classroom and it's something that, you know, I teach students, you should consider this. Um, you have to go above and beyond what the Institutional Review Board or the IRB is expecting 
as far as ethical concerns, that it's your job as a researcher to do even more than that. What about you, Rosalinda? Have you been thinking about this with regard to your own research? Yeah, I, I think about this a lot, actually, because I work, well, most of my research is um, with students of color in the library. Um, and so one of the ways that I've tried to uh, educate myself is by committing to doing my research with undergraduate students. So I always have an, an, an intern that I work with who kind of drives the research questions that we ask. Um, and um, all of my interns, the requirement for the internship is they have to self-identify as, as a student of color as well. And so I feel that that helps me understand the community a little bit better. Um, and it also helps me, I'm really lucky where I, where I work at, in my institution, our students who do undergraduate research tend to want to do them based on their own communities and where they are. Um, and so uh, right now we're actually working on a project with transfer students, which is something I had never learned a lot about in the LIS research. There, it's, ten, it's a newer topic, um, I think, in some ways. Um, you'll find more research in the last five to 10 years on transfer students. And so my intern this semester is a transfer student and he's really interested in learning more about transfer students and how the library can help them. And so we're kind of trying to figure out you know, what kind of methods should we use? We wanna do interviews, that kind of thing. But I really try and recognize the, the, the power differential between he and I, um, because I'm still his supervisor and things like that, a mentor. So you're kind of fulfilling multiple roles at the same time, but kind of allowing the student to drive the research so that there's more of that peer-to-peer -peer relationship um, when you're talking to that, to that community. So that's the way one way that I've been thinking about it, but I also just feel very, very cautious um, about working with the student population I do work with and just going really slowly. And, and that's kind of, that's where I'm at right now. Um, it looks like we have a comment in the chat from Rosalind and it says, I've definitely grappled with accepting that I will get some of it right, but most of it wrong. I think in some of my more race-based research, I have to, I also continually ask myself, why am I researching this? Which is something you've talked about, Jennifer. Yeah, um, and I think also admitting, so it's, it's okay to engage in this ethic of humility, but I think also you have to be wary of where you're revealing this idea that I'll get some of it right, but most of it wrong. I would never want graduate students to go to their dissertation defense and in front of their committee say, well, I think I got some of it right, but probably the rest you can ignore because it's wrong. Um, I think, you know, if, if you're engaging with your committee at the very beginning in honest discussions of the limitations of all research, then, you know, that's perfectly okay. But I think, you know, outside of certain communities and outside of certain fields, this ethic of, of humility would not be well received or well accepted because as researchers, we are supposed to be these knowers and we are supposed to be discovering something through our research. Um, and so, you know, while I embrace it, um, certainly because I've position myself in a community that understands it, um, I would also, you know, just encourage students who haven't yet obtained a PhD or a master's degree who are conducting research to just be careful um, in some ways of how much you're revealing regarding your, you know, this perception that you're, you don't know it all or that you haven't discovered it all. Um, we have a question that came through the Q&A um, from Catherine Gray, who asks, um, do you have experience with the ways in which practicing an ethic of humility in the classroom as a professor, professor clashes with students' racialized and gendered identities, or sorry, gendered ideas of authority? Um, and how have you dealt with that dynamic? Yeah, Catherine, thank you. I think maybe um, we were reading each other's minds because in some way what I revealed um, is kind of a, 
a challenge to someone's understanding of who a researcher is and what we're bringing to the table. Um, so I, I think the same is true in the classroom. Um, there are students who, you know, struggle with this idea, and I remember struggling it, struggling myself um, in graduate school. My my study in um, graduate graduate school was on racialized femininities and how undergraduate students at a predominantly white institution were performing racialized femininity, um, and I remember my advisor. Sari Bicklin asking me at one point, so what makes you know more about femininity than, the, than a hairdresser, for instance? Um, and I struggle to answer that question. Um, so I think having those honest discussions in the classroom can, you know, can help the situation. And I know sometimes students want you to be the knower and the authority. I mean, that's why they're taking the class, they want to soak up knowledge and learn from you. But I think if you approach it um, from an epistemological standpoint that we're constructing knowledge together, that you know, I want to learn from you as much as you learn from me, I think that's helpful. Um, and I, I will say in the end, as much as I want to just go into the classroom and only have discussions and you know, always have it be open, in the end, I learned that if I start a class with a PowerPoint presentation of maybe 10 or 15 minutes, that makes those students feel a little better because they feel like, okay, I learned from her and now I have some notes to take, especially those who aren't as comfortable learning through discussion. And so, you know, I, I do both. Um, you know, I don't prefer the PowerPoint lecture because I do think it um, makes it seem as if I, you know, I know the most in the room when that isn't always true. Thank you. We have a question from Marie in the chat. Um, so would an ethic of humility ever prompt you to decide to not pursue research within a group you might not know enough about? Um, and she's referring to a presenter we had last year who was talking about indigenous methodologies and decolonizing methodologies, talking about you know the right to know as a researcher. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I you know I do think that as researchers um, we do have to tread carefully. I think um, Rosalinda, you said in your own project you're treading carefully and slowly, and I think all of us need to be mindful of that. And so certainly um, it's okay to accept that sometimes you shouldn't have the right to know, especially when you're border crossing um, and you are, you know, studying in the article we talked about studying down versus studying up. Um, for many researchers, it's easy to get access to more marginalized communities than it is to communities of privilege. Um, and so you have to be especially careful and proceed slowly. And, you know, at some point, if it doesn't feel right to you, then, you know, pull back and say, you know what, this isn't an appropriate community for me to study. Um, we have a question um, in the Q&A. Uh, do you address your uh, positionality in your articles? Yes, I do. Um, and I, you know, I think it's important to, and I encourage all researchers to do so. Um, again, it, it goes back to audience because there are some journals that I've published in where I've talked more at length um, about my positionality and how it may have affected the research. In, um, in a, a book on popular culture, on intersectional analysis of popular culture, um, our co-author and I, and actually our editor was Kakali Bhattachara, so we're quite familiar with her work, um, but Kakali had encouraged us to do more personal reflection. And so we created what we called these moments of theory in the flesh, where we became incredibly vulnerable and honest about our thinking 
um, along this research process. Um, and now that it's in print, and I know, you know, some graduate students um, that I know and work with have read it, sometimes I feel like, whoa, we just broke ourselves open and we were so incredibly vulnerable in there. But I think, you know, continually revealing that positionality is important um, because it does, it, you know, I can't stress enough that it does affect every aspect of the research project. Hi, my face means that we need to wrap up. I'm so sorry to see our time together end. I feel like we could uh, invite you to our next coffee chat session to continue this conversation. Um, so thank you today to Jennifer, Hillary, and Rosalinda for your efforts. Um, can we get some applause for them in the chat? Uh, thank you to Loyola Marymount University for its support of the Institute for Research Design in Librarianship. Thank you to the Institute of Museum and Library Services for your consistent grants, grant support of IRDL since 2014. Thank you to the team that labored to put together this learning event. Uh, please join us on January 24th at 10.30 to noon Pacific time for the next speaker in our series, Jonathan Rosa. His talk is titled Latinx Languages and Identities Beyond Borders. So with that, I'm just gonna pop into the chat, the, ser the URL for the speaker series one more time so you can register for future events. And with that, we'd like to end today's session. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye everybody. <laughs>